So here's the question you've all been waiting for. Is Total War Pharaoh any good? And I've been playing the Early Access weekend this weekend. I've had about 10 hours in the game. So I'm going to try and answer that with a few of my first impressions of the game from the 10 hours I've managed to squeeze in in this Early Access weekend. Of course, this isn't a full review, guys. I've only played 10 hours. It is first impressions from the 10 hours that I have played. And of course, like you guys know, I am not affiliated with CA in any way. I did not get an early access copy. I have not been given anything by CA. In fact, when the game first came out and was released, I dubbed it Total War Dung Beetle. So, <laughs> of course, I am not biased in any way. In fact, I have been very critical of the new games that CA have been releasing. And I am a big classic Total War stan. You're talking Rome, Medieval 2, um, Napoleon, Empire, all those sorts of games. I haven't properly played a brand new Total War game apart from Warhammer 2 for a very long time. Because personally, I haven't really enjoyed them. So I wanted to just lay out all those biases before you get into the meat and potatoes of the video so you know where I'm coming from when I talk about this game. It's safe to say that my expectations going into the game were not very high. And it's also safe to say that it was not the game that many people wanted or expected, including me. Medieval 3 was very high on my list of games that I wanted or Empire 2. And uh, Total War Pharaoh kind of came out of nowhere. But how has it been for me? I mean, overall, I've got to say, I'm quite impressed, guys. <laughs> and it doesn't hurt me to say that, but <laughs> it does feel weird, me saying that. Um, because as someone who did call it Total War Dung Beetle when it first came out, I mean, I stand by the fact that that trailer was really terrible equating your game to a dung beetle um you know i wasn't excited at all for this game but i've got to say i've been quite enjoying it i haven't been loving it i mean it's not been like a revolutionary experience but at the same time i've not disliked it either and that's a strange feeling for me when i play one of these modern new total war games because most of the time when I've played them, I've outright played an hour and really not liked it. I've tried to get into, you know, Warhammer a lot of times and uh, some of the other newer titles. And for me, I've just not really enjoyed them. I've not gelled with the engine and with the gameplay. But so far in Pharaoh, I have been pleasantly surprised. And there's a few reasons for that. And it's one of those games... And it has made me want to keep on playing, which, like I say, is very rare for me with these new Total War games. I don't think I've had that on a Total War game since about Rome 2, which is about 10 years ago, guys. So it's a long time. But let's go through a few of the areas. I've rambled on enough about my general perspectives and talk about some of the good and bad in all of these areas. While, of course, gameplay is playing in the background for you all to enjoy so let's first talk about the campaign map and in general it is stunning isn't it it is a beautiful campaign map it is really really nice now i believe troy has a very similar campaign map so it's kind of similar to that but this new sort of uh, era of campaign maps i mean we've seen it with paradox with uh, vicky 3 how beautiful that map is and now I think we're seeing a similar thing with CA and the Total War series. Please keep these sort of campaign maps going forward. Now, I don't think a campaign map with such huge differences in terrain and all that sort of thing in terms of the heights and sort of dramatic amounts of different things like forests and stuff like that being massive on the campaign map. It's all scaled very large and very cartoonishly. Uh, I don't think that would work for a grittier game like Medieval 3, for example, or Empire 2. But with this setting, it seems to kind of work. And it does look really nice. There isn't a huge variation between a lot of the areas. But what can you say? I mean, the areas are very similar in terms of their look and their climate. So apart from really the, the Nile, the, the areas do all look very similar. 
And of course, we only got the option to play as Ursu or Ramesses in this. So I couldn't really go and have a look at the Anatolian lands as well. But yeah, we only got to look at a few of the other ones. Now, one of the bad things about the campaign map and something that you do notice very early on is that it is indeed pretty small. It's, in general, a small game overall, I've got to say. A small game doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad, however. I mean, a small game with all its elements done really well can be very, very good indeed. I mean, compare Fallout 4 to, say, something like Outer Worlds. Fallout 4 is a pretty large game. Maybe not as large as some of the other Bethesda releases, but a pretty large game nonetheless. But if you compare that to Outer Worlds, which is a relatively small game with a lot of smaller elements done really well, I would pick Outer Worlds uh, every single day of the week. But I do know a lot of people do still like Fallout 4. I'm an old Fallout fan, but we are getting beside the point. So it is quite small, like even in some places, especially around Syria, etc., you can kind of cut the whole map in half with like two or three regions being taken. And it's not exactly that immersive when you have a map so small. And of course, we are missing a lot of other cultures from the time as well, which would be nice to have the Greeks and the Mesopotamians as well. And I hope to God that they do not release parts of the map as part of DLC. That, of course, would be a real, real shame. Now, in terms of how the map functions in the campaign and the economy and all that sort of thing, I've got to say I love the resources. And I think it's a really, really good addition to a mainline total war game. More of this, please, in the future. Even if it's a more in-depth trade mechanic in the future and not something that's so relevant to the rest of your construction and stuff, I still think these resources need to be part of the total war games going forward. Not exactly these resources, but this resource system of managing resources and managing what you're doing. And in, in most cases, I've found... I am going on conquests to go and get resources. That's the main reason why I'm going on conquests. And it kind of works with the time period as well. Now, I don't know how they would maybe mix this into a Medieval 3 or an Empire 2. But we have seen similar things in the past with Empire, for example. All the different trade resources. I thought that was fantastic. So I would love to see more in-depth versions of this going forward and maybe a more grittier sort of a modular version or a more granular version where you can have a bit more impact on those resources as well but yeah the resources are great and they do affect the economy quite significantly because if you get into a deficit of those certain ones like food and bronze are going to mean you have a uh, attrition in your troops you know no stone means that you can't build guys i would recommend getting stone as quick as possible because it's not one that passively goes away so you are always accruing it until you decide to build a building wood as well is really important but yeah gold i have found is not that important it's kind of just an extra as a resource but yeah it's it's still worth getting it's just not quite as important and i think whether that's realistic or not, I have no idea. But I don't know. I quite like the resource system. I think it's a really good addition to the economy. Now, building-wise, they have touted the fact that there are loads of building chains apparently in the game. And I am still not a big fan of the province system. Unfortunately, I don't think that's ever going to be changed. I would prefer to have full building options in every single city, like the classic Total Wars. That is just my personal opinion. But in terms of the building chains, this is one area that I think seems broader and bigger than it actually is. Again, it's quite a small area. Um, when, you, when you get into the game, you think, wow, there's loads of building chains. But what tends to happen in a resource settlement that's not the capital of a province? You'll just build all the resource buildings in that in that region. And then similarly in the other regions in the city. And then only the, the only place that you really differ from that is the region capital. And there you might build some military buildings, all that sort of thing. 
But because the campaign map is not that big, and you're not conquering a huge amount of provinces, it kind of means that you don't really get to specialize those buildings early on and those uh, capitals early on because you need so many different things. You need all the resources. You need to be able to recruit as well and you need to be able to upgrade your troops on top of that. So, you know, your first faction capital is quite hard to really just focus, say, on military and make it a recruitment hub or something like that because you've got so many other pressing concerns. Now, I do like that and dislike that kind of in equal measure, but I think it's just a symptomatic problem uh, based on the province system rather than anything the game does particularly wrong. On top of that, they also have the outpost system, similar to the town and village system that you had in, say, Empire. Again, I know we keep going back to Empire, but it's a good system. I do like it having these extra bonuses that you can get in the provinces, but I've got to say the building options here are so limited. Why could they not have a building chain for the outposts as well that is similar to the buildings in the actual city and is linked to the workforce and linked to the um, the level of the city as well? Because a lot of buildings are blocked off based on the level of the city, very much like we see in every other Total War game. Why couldn't they do that for outposts? And why couldn't we have so many more options? Because I've just found myself after the first couple of hours, just realizing that you want a trade one in every single settlement so you're getting more resources. And if you're unhappy uh, in your region, you want a uh, temple. And you might get a maybe an attrition one if you are trying to reduce the attrition of moving around some of the more deserted lands. Or you might get a recruitment one just to get a bit of extra recruitment boost. Like there's not really that much variation there. And it doesn't add too much into the game except a different menu to click and build buildings it's not really a huge addition now if they'd have come out and made it really really varied with lots of different options i think that would just really bring it to the fore and make it a very powerful and very good tool for you going forward and force you to specialize a little bit more in the cities now, with the buildings as well, you have your workforce, which grows, and I do like that system. It's fine. I don't see any problems with that at all, similar to uh, population and religion mechanics that we've seen uh, previously in other games, and it's fine. There's no problems at all that I have with that. You've also got your influence and happiness, and I've got to say that happiness, especially when you are going on the offensive, is very, very hard to come by. Sometimes, like, these dips in happiness are so large that building happiness buildings seems almost futile. Like, you might have a minus 20 happiness in a region because you've just conquered it, but the building that you're going to build gives plus one. Like, it seems almost pointless. So I would quite like to see that balanced in the future. And I know it's to try and stop you snowballing, but who doesn't like a good Blitz campaign? Now, as well with the growth and the influence, you get the influence within the city as well, the influence over the region. And I kind of feel like the influence plus the happiness is one mechanic too far. The influence kind of just seems a little bit pointless. I don't really fully understand what it's doing. I don't really fully understand why it's there. And I've hardly paid much attention to it. I just look at the happiness and the growth rather than the influence. Maybe I'm playing terribly. That That is... A very likely scenario, or it could be the fact that the influence isn't really hugely important as long as you're just above 50%, it might be good. So whether there's some more impact they can add into the influence and maybe whether there's sort more um, integration with some of the buildings, that would be cool. But yeah, it's, it's fine. It, it just doesn't seem to need to be there to really add anything into the game. But overall, I have enjoyed the campaign gameplay, and as a massive campaign management nerd, I love the added challenge of balancing all your resources as well. But if you fall behind on resources, you can use diplomacy to set up trade agreements, and in this, you can directly trade resources, and I think that's a great addition. And you do tend to trade a lot, and it's a, it's almost like a market that you would get in some other games. I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think like Banished or Farthest Frontier, something like that, where you are paying other people or, or trading resources with other people to get the resources 
you need. And I think that's a really good addition to the game. The diplomacy for me so far has has been fine. I think it's quite difficult to get alliances, really, unless you're paying them a lot of resources. Uh, but non-aggression packs have seemed pretty easy to get. And yeah, it's not too bad. And the AI just doesn't seem terrible in terms of their diplomacy like they have been previously. They seem fine. They don't seem horrendous and they don't seem amazing. I've not had any problems with the diplomacy so far. On top of this now, we've also got a new court and deities and legacies system. I think the court is a relatively interesting system initially. And I'd love to see how it plays out later in the game. But in terms of it being that useful and, and that important, I, I don't really get it that much. It doesn't add a huge amount into the game whereas previously you know in a lot of total wars you're just going to conquer areas and take them over whereas in here you're going to you want to be named the pharaoh of course i've only played 10 hours so uh, i've not got to that point quite yet because you need a lot of influence to become pharaoh and honestly when you get to the election cycle or whatever it's called i can't remember the exact wording of it um the intrigue actions just kind of the influence actions should i say just kind of become more of an annoyance that you have to do every turn and they don't seem that impactful and they don't seem like they're doing a huge amount and even when you get a court position it doesn't seem that useful either so i don't know it's an interesting system i would have liked to have it a bit deeper and maybe they will add a bit more depth into it in the future but one thing that i do love that's an addition is the deities and you discover more gods when you take sacred lands on the campaign map and you discover different gods that all give different effects and when you do that then you can build the temples to them and you can have different effects and you can change that god pretty willingly depending on what legacy you choose as well the one thing that does slightly annoy me about this though is that when you do change a deity it takes two turns for the temples to change over to that new deity and i would like to see an option for you to either change it over or not because more likely than not you probably will want it to change over but you don't want every single one of your temples to change over to your new god i mean like, you might change the god over because you want some more happiness, or you might change it over because you want some more military, but maybe you only want that deity in there. I don't know whether that's a balancing thing, so you can't just keep changing the deity, but maybe they want to make the change cost a bit more expensive and then allow you to actually do what you want with your temples rather than uh, just one deity and every single temple has to be theirs, including the outpost ones as well. It just seems a bit forced that that has to be the case. But I do really like all the different deities and all their balancing and different um, modifiers. And in general, I've got to say, all the economy stuff, it seems pretty nicely balanced. Sometimes you can fall a bit behind on one resource, but you've got to go out and conquer more. Um, the only one thing that I think maybe is a bit unbalanced is maybe the fact that the bronze, for example, like if you have a fully decked out bronze region in a province that uh, is creating a lot of bronze, it can't even sustain a one one full stack. So maybe that needs to be changed a little bit so that, you know, one province uh, that is fully decked out with bronze can support a full stack because... It just seems a bit unnecessary that it can't um, uh, support that singular full stack. Because one full stack, let's be honest, is not that many troops, really. Um, along with this, you also have access to legacies, which are fine. They, they, I've not managed to play with them a huge amount because, of course, only 10 hours played so far. But, yeah, they are they are fine. They're, they're not amazing. Like, uh, <laughs> And I just wish there was a few more. And I'm assuming when we get access to all the characters, a lot of the characters will have different ones. But it seems like they're very similar legacies for everyone. I'm not 100% sure on that. And I just wish that there was a lot more added in. There, should be, there shouldn't be two. There should be about 10 different legacies that, that cover everything as well. Let's now talk 
a little bit about the tech tree. That's one area that I do have concerns with. The tech tree seems almost random. I don't know how they planned it and how they made it like this. And also, why did they go for this look with the tech tree as well? I don't really get it at all. <laughs> like, why go for that? Go for a standard tiered tree downwards, upwards, or sideways, whichever way you want to go. Go that way as well. And the techs seem almost random. You'll have, like, a tech that gives army XP that'll unlock, like, 10% stone uh, production. 10% more stone production. I have no idea how they're linked, why they're linked. And it's a little bit immersion breaking. I really would like to see the tech tree organized based on civil, economic, and military. And I don't know whether they've done that so that you can't go OP in one area. But let us choose, man. Let us choose. If we want to go crazy into the economy or crazy into the military, let us choose. Maybe make uh, them take a little bit longer. But yeah, they just seem really weirdly organized and really weirdly tiered. I, I don't get <laughs> some of the texts leading on to each other just do not make any sense at all. And it would be nice to see that cleaned up a little bit as well. Along with that, Leveling, leveling up the generals, it seems completely fine. They've balanced it quite a bit. Obviously, from Warhammer, where you're getting OP uh, hero characters. These guys are not heroes anymore. And it reflects in the generals' um, extra bonuses and stuff. A lot of the bonuses to what you get are really campaign bonuses and less army bonuses. And I think that's a good change because... We don't want hero characters in a historical that are just going to ruin everyone. Um, so they've tried to balance that out and it does seem relatively balanced because a lot of what you upgrade will actually be a campaign bonus rather than a battle bonus. There are still battle bonuses, don't worry about that, but they have been tempered so that your bodyguard unit isn't so OP and that your... Uh, your army isn't hugely OP as well. Nothing really that new here. Standard stuff from the modern, more modern games. And it's absolutely fine. There's no problems whatsoever with it. In terms of the AI, I have seen some people complaining about the AI on YouTube and on Twitter, of course. I personally haven't had that many problems with it. Occasionally in a battle, the AI will stand off for no reason. Uh, when they're attacking you and then you kind of have to goad them into action But apart from that they seem relatively standard uh, Standard total war AI. Let's be honest total war AI has never been <laughs> Amazing uh, To say the least so it's pretty much just okay. It's not fantastic and it's not terrible like it's it's just pretty standard total war AI on top of the legacies, the deities, and the court as well, you get this civilization sort of uh, modifier as well that goes from, you know, prospering to strife down to, you know, collapse of society. And from that, I found that either nothing will happen, it won't go down, or everything will happen in, like, five turns. <laughs> so, either way... It, it, it kind of simulates the, the, the quick collapse. Um, but honestly, I feel like the collapse happens very early a lot of the time. And I would like to see that, you know, maybe some of the modifiers reduced on it so that it happens a lot later. Because it seems you're only just starting the campaign. Maybe only conquered one region or, or one extra province or maybe two extra provinces if you're going fast. And already society's collapsing and there's a civil war. Uh, and the civil war mechanic as well does seem very early. So if in case you're wondering, you can have uh, people with a lot of influence that get a lot of influence very early and challenge the pharaoh to become the pharaoh. And honestly, these civil wars have, I've found have all happened really, really early. Now, I don't know whether that's modified so that we all get to experience it on the early access weekend. But going forward, I would hope that they you know, kind of um, uh, make some of the modifiers slightly less so that we're not getting civil wars in like 10 turns uh, because it just seems a bit obsess uh, excessive 
and a little bit crazy, to be honest. <laughs> Same with the Civilization Collapse, because when Civilization Collapses, you get the Sea Peoples, everything like that. And I found in one of my campaigns, I literally got the Collapse maybe turn 12, 13 or something like that. It was, it was really early. And at that point, about, you know, 40 units of Sea Peoples just land on your shore and kill everyone and you've only got one full stack at that point because uh you know it's not very far into the game and you, you're trying to balance your resources so i just like to see a bit more balancing with that and the sea people's invasion it seems fine it's not hugely exciting but i would like to see it you know more of a late game thing that is really devastating rather than sort of a lukewarm uh, early game thing that's not that devastating. I don't know. It's uh, it's an interesting one anyway, but I think just a little bit of extra balancing needs to go on, go on around there as well. So let's now talk about the battles. And I am someone who hasn't really liked the engine for melee combat since Rome 2. I know it's the same engine as Empire and Napoleon. Please don't comment down below that it is. But I think it's an engine that works fantastic for ranged combat, but it just doesn't work so well for melee combat but so far i think they've struck up a relatively decent balance uh, in terms of speed of battles versus tactics of battles now the battles are hugely tactical it's pretty much line of men line up go against each other and who can grind the best there's not a huge amount of tactics unless you've got a few flanking forces and i think that's indicative of the time period and the lack of cavalry and yeah, you have chariots as your cavalry, but honestly, the chariots are very clunky and don't tend to work amazingly. That's what I've found anyway. The chariots tend to charge into units, stop because of the engine, because the engine can't handle it, and then suddenly just surge through the unit. So, like, the charge, they'll kind of charge in, stop. And then suddenly there'll be this big like tidal wave surge that they do, which I don't know is, is the, whether that's the engine's way of trying to get around the fact that it can't handle charges. But yeah, the engine still is a problem for me in terms of the battles. But honestly, they've been fine. I haven't really disliked them. I haven't loved them, but they've been pretty okay as well. Now, in terms of the other sort of stuff with the battles, unit variation is a little bit of an issue. If you're coming from Warhammer, you know, it's not going to have the unit variation that Warhammer has. And personally, I don't think it ever could because, of course, Warhammer is a fantasy world with, you know, thousands of different units for very, very many different cultures. They're all completely different. Whereas, of course, we're talking about a historical where cultures are relatively similar and warfare at the time was relatively similar across the board in that region mind you don't comment down below saying actually you know these guys used an eight foot spear and these guys use a 6.5 foot spear or something like that across the board tactics were relatively similar and it kind of reflects itself in the battles and it doesn't help that a lot of the time with the with the units that we've been uh, given with the uh, sorry the people we've been given to play Ramesses and Ursu, like, you are, of course, fighting your own culture people uh, early game. So you are just fighting units that are very similar to yours a lot of the time. But, I mean, it's been fine. The one-on-one -on -one animations, I still think, is an issue. It 100% is an issue when it comes to chariots. That's another reason why chariots are so weird in the game. Because the one-on-one -on -one animation seems to break when it's chariots. I don't know what's going on with that. Like... You know, the one-on-one -on -one animations for the melee units, it looks all fine. But, yeah, you get you get animations crossing over each other, all that sort of thing. I don't really like it. I prefer the old system, but I always have. And I probably always will. But then the chariots do completely just break the one-on-one -on -one animations because they kind of charge through, break up a load of people that have already initiated animations and then they're kind of teleporting and well not teleporting but rushing like back against each other and it's a little bit weird and a little bit janky i've got to say but most of the time you're going to be zoomed out in the battle so it doesn't matter too much anyway most of the units look relatively decent 
Um, how historically accurate they are, I have no idea. I would suggest that probably not hugely uh, <laughs> in a lot of cases. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're relatively decent. The unit variation is a little bit disappointing sometimes, though, because you've got a unit that all looks very, very similar. Not huge unit variation. A lot of the time, the unit variation is just a different color shield or a different color, uh, you know, head uh, headband or whatever they're wearing. And it doesn't really, you know, give that illusion of really detailed and very varied units. But like I say, you're mainly zoomed out. Uh, as well now the battle maps are quite small so i don't know whether they're going to expand them in future but they're relatively small especially if you get more than 20 units they're fine for a 20 unit battle but after that uh, i would love to see 40 unit battles i don't know why we haven't got it maybe we will we will do when the game releases or in future but yeah, we need 40 unit battles and we need slightly bigger battle maps. But then the, on the other end of the spectrum, the siege maps are massive. <laughs> they seem huge. And, um, you know, a lot of the time the siege, siege map in the city is massive. But your guys will just be fighting in one little tiny area and it kind of looks ridiculous. Um, so maybe the siege maps need to be reduced and the battle maps may be increased in size. They might exact be exactly the same size, but of course, siege map, all the fighting is concentrated in, in small areas. Um, so yeah, the armor rating for units as well is just a little bit silly. I don't know why they went that direction of having an armor rating for a whole unit rather than individual soldiers within the unit. It just doesn't seem to make any sense. Um, I don't really get it at all. I guess it's to make sure you use uh, missile troops. But yeah, I don't know. Maybe they could represent that still. But still show how many of each. Uh, and still have it so that it's, you know, per soldier. Because one soldier getting hit by three javelins shouldn't ha then have the same amount of armor as one at the back of the unit that's not been hit by any. I, I don't know. It seems a little bit weird. Um, but yeah. I, I think the battles are generally pretty good. They're pretty fine. Not terrible. Not amazing. Um, and the chariots are a bit janky. But apart from that, relatively good. I quite like them. Um, now, let's talk about one of the major good things about this game as well. I've got to say the UI is absolutely fantastic. The campaign map zooming in and out from the tactical map down below is glorious. It's really, really nice. The UI works. It's really seamless. I've found it to be really good. And there's a lot of tooltips on there to tell you what to do if you're struggling with what to do as well. I think it's fantastic. I think whoever's designed the UI, well done. Great job. Really, really, really nice. There is one area of, of the UI, though, that is a bit broken. The fact that when you're on the diplomacy screen, if you click on a region and a nation and you click on them, they, it won't take you to them. So then you have to go down and scroll through the list. I will, that's just a little quality of life thing, please, guys. Please, CA. Just, just make sure that you can click on a nation and it will take you to diplomacy with them rather than you having to click on them and then scroll through the list. You might as well just scroll through the list to start with. So yeah, it's just a little weird thing that maybe is a bug or maybe they will change for release. Now let's talk a little bit about some of the things that I don't really like about the game. Like I said, the Civil War seems a little bit too early a lot of the time and a bit annoying. Um, same with the civilization collapse a lot of the time from what I've found. So maybe some balancing just needs to be done and like i say the sea people's invasion is less a momentous event and more just kind of annoying like that's it it's just it just kind of breaks your stride from conquering other places and you just kind of get a little bit annoyed by it rather than it being this big scary event like the mongol invasion in a uh, in medieval or anything like that or, or a crusade or something like that that seemed momentous and a lot of things were happening um it just serves more as an annoyance than really this big momentous um, event in terms of the performance for some reason now this is very weird when my campaign is loading anything so going from a battle to the campaign map or vice versa it will tab out and not respond but it is responding because it's loading 
and it will tab out and take me to my home page to well to my you know uh, main screen on my computer and load there I, I don't know why it wants to do this maybe this is my system but I've never had that for any game ever before so hopefully that issue is fixed before release and I have had one crash but that's it that was mainly due to that stupid tabbing out loading option I don't know why it's doing that but it is quite annoying, <laughs> and I wish it would just stop doing that. I want to I stay on the game when you're loading between screens game, please. But overall, guys, I've pretty much enjoyed it. Now, I would recommend you don't pre-order the game. I recommend don't pre-order any game, in fact, just because you never know what's going to happen. You don't know what state the game's going to be released in, um, and I would say... Wait for a very trusted review source to come in, which hopefully should be me. So if you uh, if you are interested in my review of this game, it will come when the game comes out. And I've had a bit more hours to play. So do subscribe and like the video at this point. That would be fantastic. But yeah, in terms of uh, pre-ordering, it's still an ex exorbitant price, I've got to say. It's still very high price. And the DLC policy just does really rub me the wrong way quite significantly i've got to say it's a little bit dodgy i don't really like the fact that it is so 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 expensive for this game for a game that's so small so like i say wait for people to review the game before you decide whether to get it especially when it's so expensive and especially in these times of high inflation Please don't spend your money on this game if you don't think you're going to enjoy it. Uh, and wait for some trusted reviews to come out from people that you trust, guys. People that you trust. And like I say, this video hasn't been a review. I've only played 10 hours. This has just been my first impressions and thoughts. But overall, I've quite enjoyed it. I've been pleasantly surprised. And I don't know whether that's because I had such low expectations to start with. But for me, I have relatively enjoyed it i think it's been quite good it doesn't revolutionize the genre or anything like that and i think ca still is struggling to stand up against the offering that say paradox has maybe not so much some of the newer paradox games but some of the games that they've got in the catalog like eu4 hearts of iron 4 uh, and crusader kings 3 are games that will go on for a very long time and already have been going on for a very long time in two of those cases and just stand up a little bit better but overall i think relatively decent i've enjoyed my time playing it and i can't wait for it to be released and then i'll see we'll see and i, and I will review and uh, i will probably do a campaign as well maybe as to or the the lady I can't remember what she's called, but yeah, as her, that should be quite fun. But anyway, guys, I hope this has given you a bit more of information about Total War Pharaoh. Hope you found it useful as well um, to see whether it's worth looking at the game when it comes out and you've seen a few reviews. But like I say, I will be releasing my own review at some point as well. But anyway, guys, thank you very much for watching. It's been a pleasure as always. Please do like and subscribe. It really does help the channel out. And I will see you all again on the next video.